All right. I sure am glad to be here. I'm glad that two of you are glad that I'm here also. What a blessing to know that all three of us are glad that I'm here. Wow, three's a crowd. I am really glad that I'm here. It took a, a long time to get here. It's supposed to be a one-day journey. For me, it's two days, but whoever thought peacocks could fly fast? <laughs> Haven't ever known a peacock to have a flat tire, though. If you'd like to, you want to stand real quick? Let me read you a passage in the Bible. I'm positive. I don't know for sure. I don't know a whole lot about your country to my uh, wrong, I guess. I haven't done a lot of research. I know a little bit about it, but I know a little bit about Christians. And I know that one of the things that all of us as Christians struggle with oftentimes, and you're to be commended for this, is, is that when something goes wrong in your life, usually the first thing a Bible believer does is, is they say, okay, what did I do wrong? And what's the Lord trying to teach me? And why am I in the spanking machine? You ever thought that before? And then in the back of your mind, have you ever thought, but I really hadn't been that bad. And I really hadn't done all that wrong. I mean, I might have had a bad thought. Maybe somebody pulled out in front of me in traffic. I experienced that a lot today with your pastor driving around. <laughs> but at any rate... But, but have you ever kind of thought to yourself, you know, I, I'm not sure I really am deserving of what's happening right now. I mean, being honest, okay, just between you and the Lord. You realize the Bible teaches you in Hebrews chapter 12, he said, Whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth. And scourgeth. And, do you know the passage? That's your place where you, you step in with that word, okay? Chasteneth and scourgeth every son. Not just disobedient sons. Not just sons who he's trying to teach a lesson to. 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 teaches you that oftentimes the Lord will allow you to go through things to make you a minister to other people in all things. That means that everything that somebody can go through, God will give the blessing of trouble to so that you might be able to minister to other people who are in that trouble. Yes, but when you're in that trouble... It's kind of a difficult thing because generally, at least in the States, we go into life as a Christian and think, well, now that I'm saved, everything is supposed to be rainbows and unicorns. Right? Let's just look at a story here and you'll know the story. I'm just going to read a couple of passages for context. And then after that, maybe just tell you probably just a Sunday school story for you to take a look at. This has to do with a story. You ever heard the story of Jacob and the coat of many colors? It's a rainbow coat, but not like rainbow like you might be thinking about. That's funny. You should laugh there, right? Because what they have done now is taken something that's sacred to the Lord where he said, I'll put a bow in the clouds and promise not to judge. I realize you're standing. Give me a second. You're going to be seated a long time. I was seated for 15 hours from Los Angeles to here. I want you to feel my pain tonight. Not to the point of hemorrhoids, but I do want you to feel my pain. So, you know, I mean, I look, I know I'm in a Baptist crowd. You know, you say, why? Because we're familiar with that hemorrhoids, right? You say, not our... Well, it, back in the States, we have them. They burn an itch. They always show up at the wrong time at the wrong place. And they continue to cry out until you give them special treatment, special ointment. And then they disappear and don't even say goodbye. Can I get a witness? Y'all don't have those over here? I... Okay, well, so, so here's the thing. I just kind of want you to understand that, listen, oftentimes what happens, ladies and gentlemen, is, is we go through troubles and trials and we don't realize that the Lord might be doing it, believe it or not, for His glory. Amen. All right, now watch this thing in the book of Genesis here. When I'm talking about a rainbow coat, a coat of many colors, I'm not referring to anything to people who are uh, non-gender specific. If that... It, Oh boy, I just I maybe I think I'm just gonna change the message here. Non-gender specific. Can I just tell you when you're born, your parents check your plumbing and they say male or female. Amen. That's simple, okay? If that's it. You don't get to grow up and decide what you're going to be. You it's decided for you when you're hatched. All right, look, I'll get on that later on. Y'all are real tight. It's, 
These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, I'm in verse number 2, being 17 years old, feeding the flock. I'm in Genesis 37. I thought you could know by me just reading <laughs> that you would like be right on top of exactly where we need to be. Genesis chapter number 37. I took my watch off. I don't know why. I don't really pay much attention to it. But Genesis 37. Are you with me now? Page 53 in an old Schofield Bible. Are we there? You ready? Somebody is going, I wish they'd hurry and get there. I want to sit down. Okay. <laughs> These are the generations of Jacob and Joseph being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. The lad was with the sons of Bilan, with the sons of Zilpha, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. And Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age and he was made a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw their father loved him more than all the, his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream and he told it to his brethren and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream that I have dreamed. Brother Sam, my associate in Jacksonville, how about you pray? Ask the Lord to bless the message, would you please? Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Let me just kind of catch you up the story if I can, please. How many of you heard the story in Sunday school? Most of you, right? Most of you know the story of Joseph, coat of many colors. I'm going to ask you a rhetorical question, just a question that I probably already know the answer to. But I want to ask you this question. Tell me what it is that Joseph did to earn the love of his father. His father just loved him because his father said... He's the son of my old age. Joseph had nothing to do with that. Tell me what it is that Joseph did to earn the coat of many colors. Can I just tell you? Nothing. There's no record of him doing anything. His father loved him and gave him a special coat, which identified him, set him apart. He had nothing to do with that. Now, unless he was smoking crack or unless he was doing other, some other kind of drugs or something that night, which it doesn't seem to indicate because he's a type of Christ in 152 to 155 particulars, right? So we don't think he was doing anything illicit. He winds up having a couple of dreams. Is that right? One of the dreams he dreams, he said, we're out in the field and there's these sheaves that are out here and there's one sheaf that's over here and all these sheaves bow down to this sheaf. I mean, can you imagine that? They get up in the morning, they're all sitting around the table eating their Cocoa Puffs or whatever they're having for the cereal and that kind of a deal. And while they're eating that cereal, all of a sudden, Joseph says, you know, I had a dream last night. And they're like, yeah, what did you dream? And he said, well, you know, we're out in this field and everything like that. And there's this one sheaf over here and there's all these other little sheaves over here. And, and uh, all the other little sheaves bowed down to this sheep. And now they're looking at each other and punching each other and like, oh boy, here we go, man. And then all of a sudden, well, tell us, Joseph, what's the interpretation of the dream? Well, uh, well I was the one sheaf over here and all y'all were bowing down to me. Now, if you're, unless you're an only child, you know what that's like when you have sibling rivalry. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that his brothers envied him first of all and then hated him three different times and then envied him again. So we know he's like Christ. Let me ask you now, just to kind of get you set up for where we're headed here. Tell me what Joseph did to cause the dream. Nothing. And he was asked to tell what the dream was. Then he has a second dream. And during that second dream, he said, you know, we're up there in the solar system and, and there's this special star out there, twinkle, twinkle, little star, you know, not, not twinkle, twinkle. Yeah. I have to clarify that nowadays because y'all, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. <laughs> You know, so twinkle, twinkle, little star, and, and so he's up there, and then all of a sudden these other stars, and in this case, the sun and the moon are up there also. And he said, okay, Joseph, and Daddy rolls his eyes and he says, say on, tell us what the dream was. Well, <laughs> all the stars bowed down to us, and the sun and the moon bowed down also. And this time, Daddy says, you mean to tell me your mama and me, they know the interpretation, are bowing down to you as well as your brother's? And he said, boy, something's wrong with you, man. You've lost your mind. And the Bible says that Jacob, he begins to ponder the thing and think about it because he's wondering what's going on there. But the Bible said his brothers hated him. Now, I've given you four instances that are right there. And none of the things that God has done supernaturally through and for that boy have anything to do with him at all. Have nothing to do with his talents. Have nothing to do with his abilities. He just happens to be special because God made him special. 
Do you ever think about that? Do you ever pause? But I'm going to show you something because it's an unusual, it's an odd story that's in the Bible. If he's God's chosen vessel, and would you agree with me that we know by reading the end of the story that he winds up in the palace and ultimately delivers what will become the nation of Israel, and he does that in a supernatural fashion. Is that true? He winds up being second only to Pharaoh. You know how the story goes after the fat cows and the skinny cows and the good corn and the bad corn right? Now think about this. If you're looking at that, by the way, put this in the back of your mind because it might take us that long to get there. But think about this for a minute. We're talking about a period of 37 years before he sees the realization of those dreams come true. Now I don't know about you, but if I were to be drawing this picture up, I wouldn't draw it up the way it went for Joseph. I mean, if I was Joseph, I'd think, okay, good. I came right out of the cradle. I've done a little bit of time at the house. I'm ready for Dad to get me promoted through some political connections. And he's going to move me over here, and I'm going to be over there, and I'm going to be the big kahuna, and everybody's going to bow down to me. End of story. But you know what's an odd thing? God seems to choose for us trials, troubles, and tribulation in order to prepare us for whatever it is that He has us to go through. Think about this long and hard, if you would, please. The Lord tells the apostles over there in Matthew chapter number 14. He says to them, He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get into that boat. Remember, they just fed the 5,000. They saw the miracle of the loaves and the fishes there, the five barley loaves and the two fishes. And the Lord says to them, I want you to get in that boat right there and I want you to row over to the other shore. And they get in that boat and they start rowing. He said, I'm going in a part of the mountain apart to pray. And so he gets ready to go up there to the mountain apart to pray. And while he's there, the Bible says, while they're in the midst of the sea. In other words, they're halfway between where they came from and to where they're going. They're right in the middle. And it was at that point where the storm begins to stir up. And guess what happens? The Bible says the wind and the waves were contrary to them. Now I'm asking you a question, and I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. I realize it's rhetorical in nature. Tell me what it is when the Bible says that the wind was contrary. God put him in the boat, did he not? The Jesus Christ, same one and the same, right? Jesus Christ told him to get in that boat. Jesus Christ told him to row to the other side. And Jesus Christ is watching them while they're in the storm. Do you ever think about that? Don't you think, don't you think that's somewhat strange? I mean, isn't it kind of our idea, our mindset, our mentality? Thank you, you must be reading my mind. Did you ever think about it? Isn't it in your mind that, listen, if that's what the Lord told them to do, there shouldn't be any trouble? I mean, have you ever thought about this? I got saved, why'd I get divorced? I got saved, why'd my child die? I got saved, why did my spouse die? I got saved, why did cancer come? I got saved. Why did I have some kind of financial trouble? I got saved. Why can't I overcome my addiction? I got saved. You can fill in the blanks. It's endless, the things that we go through as Christians. And sometimes we fail to recognize, number one, maybe the Lord is looking for someone who can take a beating without complaining about it. I know women men are looking for that, to have somebody that'll just step up and just take the beat down because it's right to take the beat down without whining and complaining all the time. I mean, we focus so much, at least in the States, on winning, 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 that now all of a sudden when people lose, I'm talking at sports, I'm talking at football, basketball, baseball, golf, uh, catching the fish, whatever it might be, that all of a sudden when they lose, it looks like they have literally lost eternity. They're whining and crying and bawling and tears are rolling off their face. They lost a ball game. It's not the end of the world. It is a, a, a whatever the sport might be. The fish jumped off the line. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, catch another one. Get a sharper hook. I mean... But have you ever looked at all of a sudden, I'm sitting on a plane not too long ago and this guy has this giant screen iPad, i something or another, but it's one of these giant ones and he's playing this Candy Crush thing that have these little things. I'm thinking, why play that game? You can't eat them. There's these little g gummy bear things that are on there and I'm like, my mouth is like watering. I'm like, eat the cotton picking things, man. And he's playing this game and then all of a sudden they, they don't fall into the little tripod thing or whatever. I thought he was going to throw the thing in the floor. He was pouting. He was older than me. He's like in his 80s and he is about to ball. 
You got to be in your 80s to be older than me. <laughs> but, but listen to me. He was upset over a game. He was playing on a plane. Have you ever paused to think how many times we as Christians who should be the bastion of understanding and should be able to enjoy the joy of the Lord which is our strength, have you ever wondered how many times we're in the midst of where God wants us to be and a storm comes up, we're the first one to throw the oars in the, bo in the boat, put the sail down and go, you know what, let's just go back to where we started. I mean, I'm doing what God told me to do and now I got trouble. That's how Southerners talk in the States. You think y'all talk funny over here? You ought to hear how we talk when we get sad. It gets long and drawed out. Lord, have mercy. You'd think, Lord of mercy, are they ever going to get it out of their mouth? It's like we want you to feel our pain so we make your ears hurt by how we talk. And all of a sudden, you know what? The Lord does look down on them and He's got to kind of give them credit. They're still rowing. That's a blessing. And He's up there watching and praying. He's probably telling the Father, I'm sorry, Peter's probably going to let something go here in just a minute and I'm working on him, so don't be too hard on him. But you know what's odd in that passage? That Bible says that the Lord came walking to them on the water and would have passed them by. But one of them cried out and said, hey, Lord, save us. And then Pete walks on the water. You remember how the story goes. Here's what I want you to see as we begin our story about Joseph here tonight. Here's what I want you to see. Sometimes God uses trouble in our lives because He picks a different path than we choose on the way to the palace. We got the mistaken idea that we get to pick the path. No, we get to pick the person, but we don't get to pick the path. God is the one that says, Moses, this is what I want you to do. Moses says, I want to do it this way. The Lord said, go sit and soak for 40 years. And after we get it straight, I'm going to call you back over there and we're going to pick back up where I left off and you're going to do it my way or it'll be the highway. And at 80 years of age, he puts him back on the path where he started, where he decided he was going to take matters into his own hands. You remember the story about David. This is a, just something to set you up. You remember how David... It was not a great idea to bring the ark back to Israel. Was that not... It had been gone 98 years. I mean, don't you think that was a great thing? Let's bring it back. Well, David says, let's go get it back. He builds a new cart. I'm positive. He's the king. Got to be the best materials ever. Got to be the best of everything ever, wouldn't you agree? He's got to get two of the best oxen in the world. And he goes up there and he puts the, car, the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant on the Ark and he starts going and he stops and all of a sudden, guess what happens? The Ark shakes, it trembles, and Uzzah reaches out there and touches it and just like that he's dead and it stops dead in his tracks. You say, why? Well, he was trying to do the right thing. Yeah, but God's not interested in you doing the right thing the wrong way. And God's not interested in how fast you do it. It's how accurately you do it. If God says, I want that thing carried with staves through the rings and I only want a certain group of individuals to do it, see, God picks the path and God picks the way the path is to be trodden. You don't get to do it just because you think, well, you know what, in modern day we need to kind of pick things up a little bit. The Lord says psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Yeah. Well, but preacher, you know, it's not about that. You know, it's not about the tune. It's about the words to the tune and all that. Something's wrong with you. Y'all have crack over here? You smoke crack over here? <laughs> Something's wrong with you. That's not, how, that's not God's way of doing things. Well, preacher, you know, we're in a modern world. It well, doesn't make any difference. We still do things God's way. Yeah. But let me ask you this question, what we're fixing to look at in Joseph's life. If you were to pick that path, if you tonight were Joseph, is that how you would get to the palace? 37 years later, he goes down there. His daddy says to him, he says, Boy, he said, go down there to Dothan and take care of your brothers and uh, uh, take them some wine and some cheese and some bread and some stuff like that. And uh, he says, you mean the ones that hate me, the ones that are envious of me, the ones that are conniving against me and contriving against me and, and they're, they're trying to, to uh, conceive some kind of diabolical plan to put together and that kind of thing? Daddy says, yeah. Which reminds me to say this. When God tells you to go feed people, you don't get to pick who you feed. You've got to feed who he tells you to feed. I like that about Joseph. The ones that hated him, the Lord said, go feed them. 
I mean, I don't know how what you think about the woman at the, that's over there at the well. That'll be in John chapter uh, 4. I don't know what you think about that woman. You read about the woman at the well. Most people don't think about her. I mean, she's over there in the heat of the day. That's when all the women of ill repute came. That's when all the women of, of, of people that are, have a bad record, the people that have been in jail and prison, the prostitutes and, and the ne'er-do-wells, that's when all the people from the west side show up. Those people, you know, those people. If I could paint, I can't paint, but I wish I could paint, man. I can't even draw a line with a, with a ruler. <laughs> I wish I could paint. I'd paint that girl with like a, a, a chartreuse green mohawk. And I'd have either side of her head shaved and have ditches cut all in her hair and stuff like that. And she'd have so many tattoos on her, it looked like she had, you know, lost a fight with a paint gun or something. And then I'd have her with, a, with a, a piercings all in her ears and chains and all stuff and all kind of stuff all over, man. And, and like she lost a fight with maybe like with a nail gun or whatever. And she wouldn't have on enough, uh, pair, enough uh, clothes to make a pair of britches for a blue jay. Or enough, you know, to make a wadding for a shotgun, that kind of thing. I mean, that's how you paint sinners, isn't it? And I'd have her coming up that street right there, and here's the Lord. He's uh, leaning over there on the well like this, and that woman looks over there at the Lord. She can't tell who it is. All she knows is it's a man. Do you ever think about this? Do you ever think what she thought when she saw that man? Every man she had ever had always took advantage of her. Every man she'd ever had always used her. Right. You ever pause to think for a minute that maybe that girl got abused when she was a kid? And maybe the reason she was so promiscuous that she was poor, maybe she had, didn't have any other way to make a living? I'm not justifying her sin. I didn't say it was right. The Lord even told her you ought not be doing that. He even said to her when she comes up there, Hey, uh, you married? Uh, well, no. Uh, well said, he says to her. The, the husband you're with now is not even your husband. Six husbands, and they're not your own? Talk about a home wrecker. But you ever pause for a minute and wonder why she's a home wrecker? I mean, what about the men that used her for that? How about holding them accountable? I mean, if they weren't being utilizing her, then maybe she wouldn't be doing what she's doing. Might have been a market for it. You get real still right there. Is that too real for you? Should I back off a little bit, preacher? You ready for me to go on the plane? Go, yeah, yeah, we should have put him back on the plane. <laughs> Preacher, it's obvious he hadn't been sleeping, man. He is like, this is peacock raw, man. I don't know what, what is he thinking? I'm thinking. I'm thinking that woman had to be walking up there thinking in the heat of the day and there's a man at the well, I bet I know what he wants. Now, you don't think that at all. You think, oh, well, I just don't think that. I think about what made that woman that way. For years, back years ago when I was a detective, long, many, many years ago, I had to investigate all that stuff. You'd be surprised what that kind of abuse would do to somebody. And you haven't ever been there, you don't know what that's like, then I'm not going to try to make it descriptive for you or try to describe it for you, but I want you to see and to understand something, that the Lord has gone out of His way for the purpose of taking care of somebody that simply needed some help. And guess what happens? It's an odd story to me. The apostles are in town. They don't bring anybody back to Jesus. That woman has an encounter with Jesus and goes into the town and turns out the entire town without a single soul winning class, without a single Romans road, without a single track. You know what she went in? She went and did her street work a different way. What would she do? Come see a man told me everything I ever did. And guess what? Turned out the entire town. The other guys have been to Bible school for three years. They couldn't bring anybody with them. But boy, that girl where the Lord did something for her, you know what happened? He took her bad and turned it into something good, and she repaid the favor by saying, you need to come meet this guy, man. He did something for me. I got my problem solved tonight. I came to Jesus. Let me ask you something now before I get into the story with Joseph. If you were Joseph, would you draw up your path to the palace the way Joseph is? Why, by the time his brothers see him, they see him coming at a distance. You know what they say to him? Let's kill him. Let's murder him. By the time he shows up over there, you know what they do? They strip that coat off of him because they're envious of that coat. They take that coat off of him and strip him down like the day he was born. He's 17 years old, man. 
I mean, you might see it different if you were a grown man, but remember what you were like when you were 17 and full of all yourself and that kind of a deal, and then all of a sudden you're getting bullied around? I bet he's bawling like a baby. You say, why? They shoved him into a pit. Naked as the day he was born, maybe with a loincloth on, and he's down there bawling and squalling. They're figuring out how they're going to lie the thing to their daddy. They're plotting to kill him. He can hear them up there, and they're eating the food he brought them. Wouldn't that irritate the stew out of you? He's trying to take care of them, and all they're trying to do is hurt them. Hey, pastor, could I just tell you something? I'm sure this goes worldwide. I can tell you this across the board. No matter how hard you try to feed people and how good your heart is, sometimes you know what they do? They'll strip you down, talk about you, and throw you in a pit. Yep. And you have to get accustomed to that. You say, why? you got to get accustomed to a beatdown. That's part of what comes with life. You say, why? God's looking for a man that he can trust with trouble. That you take the good as well as the bad. It's not always about winning, winning, winning. It's, yeah, I lost. But you know what? I'm getting back up and I'll win the next time. I lost again. Well, you know what? I'm getting back up. I'm going to keep trying until at least I can win one. You can't hang your hat on just wins in life. More, lo one, more understood and learned from losses than, li than you are from winning. Is this helping you at all? I can cut the sermon short. By a few seconds anyway. <laughs> But here's the thing that happens. They throw him in a pit over there. You ever been in a pit? Dark. No food. No water. People talking about you. Plotting to kill you. Left with your own thoughts. Nobody talking to you. In the South we sing, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms. Little bitty skinny ones and big old fat ones. I'm going to go eat worms. Why? Because nobody loves me. And everybody hates me. So I'm going to go eat worms. You ever been down in a pit? You ever been in a pit of depression? Say, Bible believers don't get depressed. <laughs> well, you don't know Bible believers like I know Bible believers. Amen. I know Bible believers, if you look at them on the outside, you're thinking, my goodness, man, they got no reason to be depressed. And they're sitting with Elijah under the juniper tree. You ever look at Elijah? You think to yourself, that's one of the greatest, if not the greatest preacher in the Old Testament. You know what happens with Elijah? He goes over there. He's discouraged. He's disappointed. You say, why? Because they said, if you win, if God wins and hits the, the uh, altar there with the lightning and he accepts the sacrifice, why, we'll bail to fall down and worship God. And the rain falls and nobody falls down and worships God. And you know what happens? He says, you know what? It's enough, Lord. Let me die. I don't have time to go into it tonight, but I want you to recognize just because you're saved doesn't mean that one day you might wish you were dead. You might be looking at a bottle of pills. You might be looking at a razor blade. You might be looking at driving fast and running into a tree. I've seen it go all kind of ways from taking a person's tie and hanging them in the backside of a van to any Christian people saved, born again, good testimony, love the Lord, believe the book, King James only, heaven's sweet, hell's hot, street preaching, glory to God, praise the Lord, graveyard dead. Magnum in their mouth. I'm out. I'm done. I'm through. I'm finished. Heartbroken. Preachers don't want to deal with that. Well, you shouldn't be that way. Well, we get that way sometimes. He's discouraged. He's disappointed. You say what? No results. Preached his guts out. God came down there and did something for him. That's after three and a half years. He's been by himself fed by ravens. And then he comes down there and does exactly what God says to do and the people don't repent and the people turn. You know what he says? I'm no better than my father. It is enough, just let me die. Why Job even said, leave me alone, let me swallow down my own spit, better if I'd have been aborted. Moses said, Lord, you want me to take care of this bunch of pinheads I got with me? How dare you uh, saddle me with such a responsibility? He said, man, I'll tell you what, Lord, I've had enough. Why don't you just kill me, move me out of the way? Moses said that, the great Moses. You know, the, let my people go. <laughs> that Moses, right? I think that was when Yul Brenner was on the throne. But, but, but listen to me. You ever pause to think about that? You ever considered that Joseph's down in a pit? Have you ever considered that? He's got no way out. I, did not, I thought he had a dream. I thought God told him two different occasions, you're going to be the big dog in the palace. What is he doing sitting in the bottom of a dry pit? Boy, if I was drawing it up, I wouldn't draw it up that way. 
I guarantee you I wouldn't draw it up that way. If I was drawing up my son coming down here, I'd have him on a white steed. I'd have him wipe out all the enemies and give everybody an opportunity to repent. They don't kill them all and let God sort them out and create a whole new race. You know what he said? I'm going to draw it a different way. He's going to go by way of Gethsemane. And he's going to go, not my will but thine be done. And then he's going to go to Calvary and willingly lay his life down. He drew up a different way to the palace didn't, and waiting 2,000 years to claim it. He ain't come yet. That was your opportunity right there. Now, you know what winds up happening? They wind up up there jawing and talking and all that kind of stuff. Let's move the story along pretty quickly here. Joseph's down there in that pit. He's got no hope, and he's without hope, and he's lost, and he's thinking, Lord, I don't know. Have you ever doubted God? I mean, you know, Romans eight twenty eight, right? You know the verse you give everybody when you don't know what else to give them? Those stupid things people say at funerals? Man, I could write a book. Really, I wouldn't, but I could write a book. I could write a book. You know what I would name the book? Stupid things people say at, at funerals. Here's a good one. Don't he look natural? <laughs> Don't he look natural? If he looked like that, you'd have to call him a zombie. That he looks dead. And he's got that kind of, you know how they put that grin on? They may not do that. Maybe they don't do that here. But in, back home, here's how they do it, you know. It's like, is, is he smiling at me or did he pass gas? What, 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 is, that, what is that grin? And, and he has, they have their hands, you know. No, he doesn't look natural at all. What is that on his face? Makeup. Why? Because he's dead. Well, don't we know all things work together for good? Then we love God. Then they're called according to His purpose. Yes, and I'm going to stick a fork in your eye if you repeat that verse to me again. Right? Well, don't we know all things work together for good? Hey, Joseph. Romans 8, 28. God made you a promise. You ever doubted God's promises? I mean, I realize you can't depend on each other sometimes. I understand that. I know vows get broken and promises get broken and things like that. But you ever realize sometimes you're looking up there at God and saying, Lord, I thought you promised there'd never be another rainy day in my life. <laughs> and the next thing you know, boy, I mean, it's come a big old thunderstorm up there, man. And you're hollering with the apostles. You're about to sink. Lord, care us not that we perish. And the next thing you know, the Lord's like, where is your faith? Well, before long, who would have thought that a, a, a slave caravan would come along and that slave caravan would be what winds up giving Joseph relief? Well, must be going to get better now, man. He's going to be in the slave caravan. <laughs> At least he's moving in the right direction. He's on the path to the palace. He's moving in the right direction. And they sell him out down there, keep his coat, and off he goes, half naked, into a prison van. And they're taking him down there to be put on display right in the middle of downtown. And they got him up there on a block and selling him off like he's cattle. His skin color is different than everybody down there. His language is different than everybody else down there. His age is different than everybody down there. And here comes old Captain Potter up there and he says to him, he says, what is this right here? It looked like the cat drug in or something. He said, I don't know. We found him down in a pit down there and put some uh, myrrh and ointment on him and things like that. But uh, we don't know nothing about him. They're poking him and pushing him and pinching him and looking at his teeth and make sure he's got that and looking under his eyes and does he have lice and does he have ticks and that kind of a thing. And he goes over there and Potiphar says, well, I'll buy him. And he buys a slave. Does that look like the path to the palace to you? <laughs> he goes over there and goes to work for uh, Potiphar and he's over there working for Potiphar and things start turning around and I won't take the time to go there right now. I'm trying to hurry to get to a point here. It's all the way in the book of Revelation so you're going to be here a little while. <laughs> We're in Genesis by the way. <laughs> At any rate, he goes through that thing. You know what he says? And the Bible says, And the Lord was with Joseph. But the problem is he didn't tell Joseph. You know what the Bible says? I promise I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Isn't that what He promised you? Don't tell me there's not times in your life where you don't look down to yourself and say, Now, Lord, you said you'd never leave me and forsake you. Where in the cat hair are you? I'm laid up here on a table having an oncologist look at my report and fixing to radiate me because they say I'm dying. 
Boy, it got quiet there. <laughs> Lord, my kids are prodigal. Lord, my business went south. Lord, I thought you said you'd be with me. <laughs> if you were to read what's going on later on, you'd say, and the Lord was with Peacock when the tire went flat on the 757 out of Jacksonville. You know what I'm saying? I'm at the ticket counter. Where's he at? Now see, I'm not like you. Y'all are like, oh no, the Lord's got this. We're all good and all that. I'm thinking, no, it's not good. Now I've got to turn around and come back and all this other stuff. And the Lord said, in all things be thankful. Give thanks in all things. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You're on the way to the palace. The tire's flat. Well, I know the tire's flat. and Well, Lord, I'm not driving. I'm flying. So who cares if the tire's flat? You have to land. Oh, yeah, well, there's that. Right? But you know what happens with Joseph? That Bible says that he winds up going down there and he's working for Potiphar. And the Bible says that the Lord was with him and the Lord blessed Joseph. And as a result, he called, uh, caused Potiphar to prosper. And one day he's back there and Potiphar's wife comes on to him. And I'm not going to give you all the story. We've got a lot of little ones here, but you understand it. You probably watch too much TV anyway. And you know what's going on with that. Hallelujah. Would you help me out just a little bit? Everybody seems to know you throw the ball back. Okay, I'm just thinking. And, and so here's the thing. All of a sudden, he's falsely accused. But he didn't do anything wrong. Wait a minute. Now, you're a Bible student, so you know this. You went to PBI, so you know more than the rest of us. So here's the thing. In that passage right there, the Bible said that he did the right thing because when she said to lie with me, he said no. He lost the second coat. Is that right? He didn't do anything wrong. He was falsely accused. And the Lord was with Joseph. And he was falsely accused. Isn't that what happened with the Lord when it came to Calvary? But I don't want to deviate here. I just want to say this. Potiphar comes home and he's like, Hey, how come everything's so quiet around here? He hears Miss Potiphar out in the background bawling, squalling, hollering, screaming, and yelling, and this and that and the other. And she's holding, standing there holding Joseph's coat. And he says to her, What in the world happened? And she said, Oh, Joseph, he tried this and he tried that and so on and so forth. And he tried to come on with me. And, you know, and I have his coat. Joseph, get your uh, posterior in here <laughs> right now. And he comes in there and he says, Yes, sir. And he says, uh, this is what Mrs. Potiphar says. He said, uh, no, sir. I didn't do it. Now, I'm going to ask you men a question. And it's straight up. If you believe that the man that had assaulted your wife was in your presence and you had the power to take his life, would you let him go? And she's bawling and squalling saying that he took advantage of her? You all see, must not be much if you'd let him go. No, you wouldn't. You'd wring his cotton picking neck, wouldn't you? you? If you got red blood in you, you would. That's not very Christian. We ain't talking about being Christian. We're talking about killing somebody and mess with your wife. That's called speed bump. It's not a moral turpitude. It's just right. You took something don't belong to you, I kill you. Right? Okay, well, it is for us anyway. Amen. So here's what winds up happening, right? So, so guess what happens? If he really believed Mrs. Potiphar, why didn't he kill him? Because he had a right to, he owned him, he wasn't even worth the price of a dog. You know what he did? He put him in prison. You know why? He said, I think he believed him. You know why I think he believed him? He didn't want to sleep on the couch. So he had to do something. So he put him in prison. Huh. And the Lord was with Joseph. Amen. What? <laughs> He's going to prison. I thought he was going to the palace to be the great potentate. He's going to be the all-powerful big kahuna. He's the guy. He's the star they all bow down to. He's the chief they all bow down to. He's God's chosen vessel. Joseph hasn't done anything wrong. And he's not even complaining about getting it in the neck. And guess what he gets? Now he's going to prison. That's insane. Now I don't know about you, but at that point right there, you know what I'd say? I ain't going to church no more. I know you're independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist. 
And I know you sometimes get upset because somebody parked in your parking place or sat in your chair or didn't make you, the preacher made you turn off the espresso machine before you got your espresso. He said, turn off the machine. I ain't even got mine yet. Everybody else got there. This is why I don't want to come to this church. Can't even get an espresso around here. Stop at Starbucks. Y'all have them here? Stop at Starbucks on the way. Amen. Or just get, get juiced off the aroma. We're almost done. In southern ease, that means an hour-ish. I know your pastor. We both from Tennessee. But guess what happens? The Lord prospers him again. And things are starting to go pretty good and he's sitting down one morning again for breakfast and two guys walk in, a baker and a butler. And you know what they say? Hey man, we had a dream. Joseph's like, oh man, here we go with them dreams again, man. That's already got me in a hurt, man. I don't, a dream. And he's over there and he's like, man, I'm eating my oatmeal. I am not saying nothing about this. And they're like, hey man, do you know know anything about dreams? And the Lord says, you know about dreams, don't you, Joseph? And he's like, you don't want to know what I know about dreams. Never mind, never mind. You you really, we're, we're good. He just keeps on. The Lord said, no, tell him. So he works a deal. I tell you what, I'll tell you what your dream is. If when you get out, you put in a word for me. That's a fair deal, right? I think. Amen. So guess what happens? He tells them the dream. And he tells, you know, the one about the butler and what's going to happen to him. And he says, hey, you're going to go and you're going to Lord, and he's going to let you go and, and this and that and the other. And then the one about the baker. And he said, yeah, not so good for you. You're going to get out and you're going to maybe make one more meal and that'll be your last one. And then he's going to lift your head from your shoulders and, and you're roasted and that kind of stuff. And then guess what happens? They get out and he kills the baker and he preserves the butler. And oh, then Joseph is, no, it's two more years. Two more years. He's sitting in prison. They never even opened their stinking mouth. Have you ever asked somebody, Hey, I'll help you, but could you help me if I need you in a pinch? And it's 3 o'clock in the morning, driving rainstorm. You have a flat tire on something other than a 757. And you say, Hey, can you help me out? And they're like, Man, call AAA. And you're like, I, I thought... Like we had like a, you ever had friends let you down? Pretty big letdown, wouldn't you? Can you tell me one person that's helped Joseph? Oh, but he's on the way to the palace. He's going to be the big dog. You're now 23 years from when he was 17 and first sold into slavery. 23 there's not even a glimpse of the palace floor he's never seen the throne he's never even seen the restrooms in the palace (laughs) nothing and the king wakes up he's in a bad mood man he's throwing stuff he's pitching a stinking fit man he's kicking stuff around he calls in all the people he said I had this dream and they said, King, sounds like a, not a dream, sounds like a nightmare. I mean, think about this, man. You have fat cows and skinny cows. That's bad enough. But then you have good corn, and then you have corn with worms and stuff in it, blighted corn and that kind of thing. I mean, that sounds kind of a bad deal. And they're all guessing around. They can't figure out what the deal is. And now the butler decides, Oh, about those dreams. I know a guy. And the king Pharaoh says, you know a guy? Yeah, when you put us in prison, which was a great thing for you to do, and we really appreciate that. I really learned a lot in prison from my difficult times that were there. Oh, mighty Pharaoh, I, I just want you to know. Shut up, get to the deal here. Well, there was a guy down there. What is he? Well, he's real odd, he's strange, he's different, he's not like we are at all in any straight uh, uh, shape, form, or fashion. But, uh, uh, yeah, well, we had a couple of dreams, and guess what? It came true exactly like he said it was. He said, go get him. He said, well, I don't 
don't even know if he's down there. You understand Joseph is in prison. He has no hope of ever getting released. There, he doesn't get time off for good behavior. He is permanently enslaved. And so all of a sudden, the guy comes down there and says, Hey, you still got that guy down here? I don't know what his name is. Is Joe or Joey or something like that? And I don't mean the kind of things that walk on their back legs. I mean like, you know, the little bitty ones and the pouch ones. Ain't that what the little ones are? They were a Joey. Yeah? Yes. You see how I just wove that in there? But now listen to me. Here's what winds up occurring, ladies and gentlemen. He comes down there, they shave him, they clean him up, and so on and so forth. And he's there before the king, and he says to the Pharaoh, he says, oh, what can I do for thee, Pharaoh? And he said, I've had these dreams. And Joseph's like, oh no, put me back in prison. <laughs> Man, are you kidding me? Dreams again? Yeah, no, no. That's, this started with dreams. Look where I'm at now. He tells Joseph the dreams and Joseph says, well, that's easy. The fat cows are good years. The skinny cows are bad years. The good corn is good years. The bad corn is bad years. That means you better put up some meat. You better put up some corn. Bad times are coming. Pharaoh said, man, I haven't seen such wisdom and all that. And Joseph says, do not interpretations belong to him. Don't be blaming me if this thing don't work out right. I've done seen what happens when the Lord tells you this is what's going to happen. And uh, I'm just saying, I, I'm, just, I'm just telling you what he said, but don't shoot the messenger. And he gives him his ring and he said, you're second in command here now and nobody will be above thee and... I don't know. I, I don't, it's a strange thing. He gives his daughter away. I mean, maybe she was fat and ugly or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's a good chance to dump her. I, I don't know. You don't know either. But why all of a sudden does he get... Maybe she's beautiful and, you know, maybe it's a Harlequin romance. I don't know. But I, that's a strange gift to me. But now all of a sudden, you know, it's, she's part of the family. Or he's part of the family, Right? Please don't be offended. Stay with me for just a minute. <laughs> but now watch. Now all of a sudden he's in the palace. And he's where God told him he would be. But the other part of the dream hasn't come true yet. Now if that was me, I would be like a stinking bird dog, a bloodhound, a Sikkim German Shepherd Doberman Pinscher on steroids, a Rottweiler, I would be headed down to hunt down every one of my stinking pinheaded brothers that had put me in the pit, caused me to be a prisoner, put me in Potiphar's house to be falsely accused, then put me back in prison. I'd be looking for retribution. Mm -mm. I'd be looking for revenge. What does Joseph do? Nothing. He's married. He's got seven years. He starts laying up all the things in store. Now we're 30 years into the story. Almost done. Can you bear with me? Don't leave him in the palace. We're not done yet. Still got a dream that he had that God promised him. Three and a half years into the famine, they run out of food. We're at 30 and a half. Three and a half years into the famine, Jake says, boys, you got to go to Egypt. We need some corn. Here's you some money. And you remember all the trickery and the stuff that goes on? And they don't recognize him. They don't know who he is. And he gives them that and then he keeps one on back and then puts the other one in prison and then this and that and the other. Remember all that stuff? And then one day they come in there and his heart breaks. And he takes off all the things that made him look like an Egyptian and he reveals himself to his brethren. And their first response is, is uh-oh. 
Yes, ma'am. They're in trouble. And he has the power to do it. Now, I don't know what you would do. I like to think I would rise to the occasion. But there's enough of the old me in me. I'm just saying, I, I don't trust me. They go get their daddy. Let me hurry this story along. They bring him back. And then his daddy dies. I'm in chapter 50 now. Now watch. The boys get together. You know what they say? Daddy's gone now. We don't have an insulator. You know what he's going to do now that daddy's gone? What we tried to do to him. You say, how do you know? Read the passage tonight when you get home. They're like, we got to go to him. You know how they came to him? They came to him. You know what they said? They said this to him. They said, hey, now listen. Our daddy wouldn't want you to hurt us. Now, now, Daddy, you know, if Daddy was alive in the South, they say, Daddy, 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 Daddy wouldn't want us. Daddy, Daddy. Right? Wouldn't want you to hurt us now. Joseph's heart breaks like an egg under a giant's heel. And you know what he says? Y'all meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Thirty three and a half years before he saw the potential for it to take place, and seven more before the famine started. Nearly 40 years, the number for testing in your Bible, and he was on the way to the palace. But if you looked at the path to the palace, you'd say, there ain't no way. Preacher, what's that mean for us today? Okay, I pretty much give up now. That means that sometimes, even though he said, you're seated with me in heavenly places... And even though he said you can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. And even though he said the joy of the Lord is your strength. And even though he said I promise I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. That sometimes along the way before we get to the palace. That the pathway can lead through some unbelievably hurtful and hard places. The hard thing is is to thank the Lord for those places. I admire this about Joseph. You never hear him complain. Not once. Oh, so unlike me. But I wonder if you pause and think for a moment, you go through something and realize that, like the lepers, you remember that Bible says, and I promise I, I'm, I'm not being funny, I, I really am almost done, I'm just trying to make a point here. Remember the lepers in Luke 17? Do you remember that the Bible says one of them turn, returned to give glory to God? Do you remember that? Yes. Do you ever read that passage? Yes. He never says, Brother Skelton, he never says, not one time, glory to God. But the Lord said, where is he that returneth to give glory to God? He didn't say glory to God. You know what he said? Thank you. Now I don't think in my twisted little brain, I don't think he's saying thank you for healing me. You know what I think he's saying? Lord, I sure do appreciate the leprosy. Because if it hadn't been for the leprosy, I wouldn't have been in a leper colony. If I hadn't been in a leper colony, I hadn't been with ten that could have yelled loud enough to get your attention. And if I hadn't been in the leper colony with the ten to yell loud enough to get your attention because you would have come by, I would have never met you. I would have never seen you. I would have never experienced what you did for me in times of trouble and times of trial and times of tribulation. Had it not been for the trouble in my life, I would have never met you and I would have never gotten to see what you do with somebody when they're in trouble and trials 
and tribulation. I think if you were to look and you see that the entrance there toward the triumphal entrance that the Lord is there and He's coming in and people are taking off their coats and they're taking down the palm fronds and they're laying all this stuff down and all of a sudden, you know what the Pharisees say? Would you tell these people to shut up? And the Lord says, you know something? If I tell them to shut up, the very rocks Amen. will cry out. Who's there? Maybe the woman with the issue. Right. I know all women have issues, but the, the woman with the... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Even if they're not in menopause. Amen. Amen. But if they're in menopause. Amen. Anyway. The woman with the issue of blood. You know what I think she's thinking? You know what? If it hadn't been for that issue of blood... If it hadn't been for that trouble in my life, I'd have never sought the Lord out. I'd have, never, I'd have never said I need something. I'd have been in the crowd and I'd have just been getting a picture with him and, you know, out there with the Pavarazzi. You know who I think's there? Bartimaeus. Old blind Bartimaeus. You say, what is he doing? I think he's praising the Lord. You say for his eyesight? No, Lord, thank you. I appreciate my blindness. Lord, I'd have never looked for you if I wasn't blind as a bat. But because you gave me blindness... I looked for you because I needed something in my life to help me. through. Lord, thank you that you blinded me. Thank you that I had the issue of blood. Thank you that my son died and you interrupted the funeral service. Thank you for all these things. Why? Because I believe they're thanking him for the path to the palace. I hate it when you get addicted to things. But you ever realize that sometimes God supernaturally move in and help you to overcome that? Yes, and you get to a point one day where He says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Where are those that return to give glory? Lord, thank you for that addiction, and thank you for embarrassing my flesh, and thank you for showing me how weak I am, and thank you when I realize when I'm weak, you're strong, and you gave me that. And Lord, I just want to thank you for that, because you know what it did? It helped me to get past myself and get to you. You say, what is that? Just a little story about a guy with a coat of many colors. A little story about a guy named Joseph. But man, what a practical story. I can relate to that. He said we're kings and priests. We're going to reign with him one day if we suffer. Amen. Who likes to hear that? But you know what the Lord does? He rewards you for suffering. No religion does that. He does. Do you ever thank the Lord for that? Instead of get bitter at Him? Instead of get angry with Him? I was closing out a meeting several weeks ago. Literally, we're coming to the end of the meeting and the telephone rings and I hear the pastor. He's standing in the hallway the aisle way. He said, what, ma'am, what? Okay, well, tell, yes, ma'am. Oh, n yes, ma'am. I could, uh, I, tell me what hospital you're headed to and I'll be right there right away. And then I heard him pause. The lady had gone home and she had had some sort of a cyst and it had ruptured and she was hemorrhaging. And here's what she said and he is listening and the siren is in the background. She's in rescue. She's on her cell phone. Only in America. And the Yelper's in the background. Yo, 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 yo. She said, Pastor, didn't you hear the sermon tonight? You don't need to worry about me. I'm on the way to the palace. <laughs> I was like, I'm going to use that one day. <laughs> Now she survived and everything was fine, but the, but the concept is this. Trouble doesn't mean you're always on the wrong path. For the Christian, more often than not, it means you're on his path. Amen. But his path's not always an easy path. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Your pastor comes, closes the service as he sees fit. Father, we'd pray that you might take what's been said tonight. Help us to recognize that all trouble and trials and tribulations and difficulty is not always because we've done something wrong or bad. 
And sometimes, Lord, we just need to be reminded that we're on the way to the palace and that you're going to become the author as well as the finisher of our faith. Help us, Lord, to be faithful to you and to be grateful for whatever it is you see fit to put us through, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Preacher.